Hello, everyone. Special thanks goes to Carmen and the AI Cafe for an invitation. It's a pleasure for uh, me to be here and giving you this talk on what I call the AI Game Changer. Uh, practically speaking, what we will be talking about today is the influence between the games domain and artificial intelligence, the ways that each one of them has been benefited from each other, basically, and the ways that interesting relationship of artificial intelligence and games has had an impact on so many domains out there. I'm based on the tiny and beautiful island of Malta in the middle of the Mediterranean, where I direct uh, the Institute of Digital Games. And I'm a professor there, uh, having a group of about uh, 20, 25 people doing research on artificial intelligence and games, what I've been doing over the last 15 years or so. And at the same time, I'm, I have co-founded and I'm involved with a model AI company, which is essentially uh, in, in which we build artificial intelligence that tests games automatically. So today I will be showing you cool projects and videos from both ends of this world, the research end and innovation end on, on that intersection of AI and games. So let's, let's get to it. This is the slide where, where, that uh, essentially encapsulates all my presentation today. And uh, what you see here is the vicious or virtuous loop between games and artificial intelligence over the last many years. So on the one end, you have AI that has been benefited through games, through the application of algorithms within the, the games domain. And, and, and you can list algorithms like tree search, Monte Carlo tree search, deep reinforcement learning, multi-agent deep reinforcement learning, like uh, in the recent case of AlphaStar on one end. And on the other end, you think of games and their technological contributions to you know, the scientific community, things like game engines, graphics, GPUs, and so on, have been technological inventions through games. Now, so we have a, a virtual or a, a vicious loop or a virtuous loop of technological advancement between AI and games. And at the same time, we experience what I call a core evolution. On one end, we do experience the revolution of artificial intelligence. On, one, on the other end, we do also experience the revolution of games. Everyone plays games these days. And so many games out there are being created on a daily, weekly basis. So algorithms and AI that are advanced through games, they can further advance games, and they can further be tested in increasingly more complex environments um, that the algorithms themselves create. So welcome to this sort of virtuous loop of uh, what I will be talking about today. And uh, I hope you enjoy it. And I hope you really sort of agree. At the end of this presentation, you really do agree with me that games is a wonderful event where we can try out new cool stuff uh, through our, you know, algorithms that essentially play, test our games, and eventually create parts of it. So, because we talk about this intersection of AI and games, well, it's it's normal to come up with to start with a definition. So, myself and Julia Dugelius came up with a definition of the field of AI and games that is as follows: making computers able to do things which currently only humans can do in games. And this definition naturally brings up uh, a question, a critical question, like what do we really do as humans in games? And when I give this presentation in, in live audiences, usually this question comes uh, now and then, and the responses are quite creative, actually, very, very creative. But most of us would agree that the, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is obviously that we play the games. So let's focus on playing games as humans. And now let's think of AI that is capable of playing games. And obviously, there are many different ways that AI can play games for different purposes. But by far, the most dominant purpose and objective of artificial intelligence over the years is to play games optimally. So what you see here is a collage of different historical moments of artificial intelligence as applied to games. 
uh, starting from Alan Turing and his application of variants of min-max tree search on chess variants, all the way to uh, the recent success of AlphaStar in StarCraft and multi-agent deep reinforcement learning. In between, you have moments like AlphaGo, combination of deep learning and tree search, Monte Carlo tree search. You have the geopardry moment, moment and then you have Deep Blue here with uh, winning Ga Gary Gasparov back in the days. So if you visit any Wikipedia page of AI, you might sort of figure out that the historical moments and the milestones of advancements of artificial intelligence are somewhat associated in the vast majority of cases with games. And that's not a surprise because games are very well controlled environments and quite complex actually for humans to play and uh, solve tasks within them. So we assume that an algorithm being able to play better than any other human is an intelligent algorithm. Well, it's a big discussion here about that philosophical question, but let's move on and go through a different perspective of playing games, an AI perspective of playing games, but not for winning, not for playing, you know, with the, with the objective of not playing better than any other human, but with the objective of, let's say, playing like a human or testing games, playing to actually test games like a human. So what you see here is what we call in, um, in uh, model AI, we call it the glitch finder product where a new level is created by one of us, by a level designer, and you have an agent, a reinforcement learning agent that explores in this sort of hard exploration domain, explores the entire level in an attempt to find any glitches, any bugs that um, we have left there as designers. Soon enough, rapidly, it will be able to identify that there's like you know, a particular ledge that can jump over. So basically can jump over the ledge and you know, beyond the level, which is problematic, obviously. So that glitch is reported back to the level designer so that you know, it is fixed and so on. And um, beyond testing, we can use AI to imitate the way we play because that is, first of all, it's cool because we can have our own sort of car here that plays like us through one only demonstration or like, you know, limited data that we provide to our AI. So it can play like I do, for instance, and then it is important for testing purposes because we can use this card that plays like Yorgos to uh, test any other given level or any other design level by humans. So moving on, on to cool um, results and cool projects on the play end, I would like, I would like us to uh, basically focus on this particular project by Shintan Trivedi, Antonio Sliapas and myself on the application of contrastive learning for learning generalized game representations. So when you think of games and when you think of computer vision applications in games and you think of their pixels, then it is natural to think of um, pixels of games having far more than just RGB colors in the sense that a frame from a game contains visuals, contains aesthetics, contains particular style, aesthetic style of a particular era that the game was designed. It contains movement, it contains experience. There's a lot going on in, a, in a game footage. So when, it, when you try out plug and play pre-trained models, computer vision models like ImageNet or ResNet and so on, you would expect that those would fail um, drastically, right? So, so then how can you possibly identify when you see and, and basically distinguish between a football game and a soccer game and a tennis game, everything is green on your screen. So how would the computer vision be able to distinguish between the three or other, other games that are out there? So Sintan here collected several frames from several sports games, uh, basically 10,000 images per genre. And uh, we, we asked then ImageNet to try to classify those games, try to give us some sort of classification between all these sort of different 10 games, game genres, sport game genres. 
And the result is a mess, as you see it here. This is a TSNE representation of what ImageNet shows you, and it's, it's bad. So very well-trained and large-scale sort of computer model, the computer vision models that are out there fail miserably distinguishing game genres, which is something that you would expect. Even if you train them now, if you fine tune the models so that they, through supervised learning, so that they actually predict the particular game genre, you still fail. But uh, when you apply contrastive learning algorithms, uh, like you know, popular contrastive learning algorithms that we include in this paper that you see here, then you are able to distinguish the different game genres, uh, as you see them here, by throwing away by by throwing away the style of the game, right? Because remember, this data set contains several different games from all the different eras of of uh, game development the last forty years, right? So you you have tennis games that they vary from really abstract aesthetics. Uh, visual aesthetics to photorealistic aesthetics. So contrastive learning works well in the sense that it ignores the aesthetics and focuses on the game and the game state representations, which is a great idea. And we also saw in a very recent result, uh, very recent findings that we had that they're under review at this point, but I want to share at this, at this point even, I'm quite excited in the sense that self-supervised learning and contrastive learning uh, mechanisms can help us in a supervised learning manner to predict particular key elements of the game. So let me be a bit more specific. You, we are looking at a football game here and we are looking at the different ways we can augment data from a football game. When it comes to game engines, the beautiful thing about them is that we can augment a data set using the standard computer vision techniques like you know, grayscaling it or you know, ro rotating and so on. But then we can use a game engine and turn the camera uh, in, in different perspectives, place the camera in different sort of positions so that we can view the same football scene from different perspectives. With that kind of game engine data augmentation, we can achieve amazing results when it comes to predicting you know, core elements of the game, like the position of all players or the position in the ball, right? So more on that, hopefully I'll be able to tell you once the paper is accepted, uh, but generally speaking, from these last two studies that I just presented, self-supervised learning and contrastive learning in combination, like supervised contrastive learning and unsupervised contrastive learning, seem to be very good ideas for learning general game state representations. Right, so let me move on to my, let me go back to my original question of what do humans do in games? And... Uh, we saw some examples of play. We saw, the, we saw the historical relationship between artificial intelligence and games. And we saw different ways that AI can play games for testing games, for imitating humans, and even for computer vision to be used as for creating general representations that could be used for gameplay. Now, going back to the question, what do we do in games? we not only play them, but you know, before we play them, we actually design them so that we play them or AI plays them. So what is very important to remember in games is that games is not just one thing. It's not just you know, a level, but uh, it is a software that features several facets of creativity. So in games, you have things like visuals that can be abstract all the way to photorealistic, as we saw before. You can have audio, music, right, sound effects and so on, you can have narrative that can vary from simple dialogues and sentences all the way to books, and you can have levels with their functional properties, their aesthetic properties, and so on. And all of these different facets need to be put together in a wonderful package, software package that needs to be experienced by humans and played and be, you know, playable, popular, be popular, um, and fun at the end of the day. So, when we ask the question, can AI or let's say creative AI do that for us? Well, the answer is yes, but it's a very hard problem if you think about it, because like all the different ways, all the different sort of content types and resolutions that we meet in games, that they are sort of orchestrated in a common software is a very difficult task for AI to achieve. Um, 
So when it comes to procedural content generation, basically the process of generating content in games using artificial intelligence, there's one can think of two ways of actually doing that. One is the fully autonomous way, so letting creative AI to design parts of a game or entire games. And the other approach is to engage AIs and humans in a creative dialogue in a mixed initiative fashion. So the AI is taking an initiative, the humans taking another initiative, and both go through a creative process and they deliver a final outcome. Now, let's look at very few uh, cherry-picked projects or um, you know, papers here and methods that uh, we have uh, we have introduced over the years when it comes to procedural content generation. And I'll start with the application of what we call surprise search on weapon generation. So the algorithm that we introduced like a few years ago with uh, Daniele Gravina is an evolutionary computational algorithm that essentially generates behaviors that they're surprising to itself. These behaviors could be anything from robot navigation all the way to visuals of a game or weapons of a game. Let's see the application of surprise search on weapon generation for a first person shooter. And I'll just show you some the number of weapons here that have been generated in Unreal Tournament 2004. What you're able to see is that you know, the algorithm is generating really weird weapons, which are at the same time satisfy particular constraints of the game, such as you know, uh, playability, balance, and so on, whatever constraints the designer might want to think of. And the result is quite the result is quite astonishing in the sense that the weapons are really weird and at the same time are playable in balance. And this is exactly what we want to come up with behaviors that are sort of unexpected to the human eye and they still work, right? Um, so I presume you got the idea already from this video. Let's move on to the next project that is really, really cool in my opinion. It's collaboration between King, the developer of Candy Crush and Model AI back in the days where we got access to the database of levels and of, of King, of Candy Crush, and we were able to infer particular patterns, global and local patterns using G, um, GANs uh, in combination with evolution computation. Thereby, we were able to create a generator, a match three tile game generator, puzzle generator, that then made it to a, a model, uh, an enhanced version of that made it to a, to a product um, that is called Puzzle Maker within Model AI. So nowadays, if you play puzzle three, much, much three tile games within the puzzle domain, um, some of these levels might have been created by Puzzle Maker. So again, this is a wonderful uh, collaboration between uh, industrial players here, innovating on the generative capacities of AI within games. Going back to my original question once more, I'm looking at time. Okay, we're good. Um, what do humans do in games? They, we play them and then we design them, but uh, obviously we do, we do many things actually, uh, but I'll just cover three th here to, uh, today, just out of, you know, due to lack of space and time. Um, so we experience games. We do experience games and games are unique domains where behavior meets cognition and emotional response. We are talking about really rich environments where and highly adaptive, fast-paced adaptive environments that can change the way we feel, they can elicit various forms of experiences. We can affect games themselves. So uh, we, we are looking at the very at a constant sort of emotional loop between humans, ourselves, and the machine that generates content that can be expressive through expressive agents and so on. There are so many games out there that they're adaptive with regards to our emotions. And uh, there's an ongoing rich research efforts on making those games even more adaptive and making those games even more personalized to our own needs, emotional needs, cognitive needs, and so on. Behavioral skills, Right. So 
the moment we understand more about players, this is the moment where we can offer better content to them. And one way to do that is called player modeling. And it's essentially the study of the relationship between what a player does and expressions and manifestation of their emotions on the left here of the, of the slide and on the right of the slide, particular labels, annotations, or whatever else we might have as human demonstrations from, uh, from our players. So what it sits in between is an AI deep learning machine learning algorithm that learns that sort of relationship. So largely speaking, player modeling is a super le supervised learning task, but as we'll see later on, it can also be viewed as a reinforcement learning task. So let me take you through a number of uh, cool projects, uh, both at the Institute of Digital Games and uh, projects that came out from model. But before doing that, I just want to introduce this slide which is essentially the better way that we figured out over the last many years on how to treat emotions and how to treat subjective labels. Now, if you think about it, any emotional label, anything that comes as a, as a value of something that is subjective, like an emotion, is really hard to sort of quantify. So we cannot easily claim that Currently, Yorgos is like 0 0.6 frustrated or 0 0.7 happy, because that is, you know, that is very vague as a, as, as a number, as a measure. So affective computing traditionally is faced with this issue. How do we value emotion? What is the value of emotion? And one of the better ways to do that, at least up, on, up until now, uh, is through treating emotional labels through an ordinal lens. So basically treating labels in a relative fashion. Myself, Rodi Gawi and uh, Carlos Busso have put together our thoughts about the ordinal nature of emotions. And that sort of thesis and position is supported both by theoretical arguments in behavioral economics, social psychology, and so on, but also from evidence in artificial intelligence and affect computing. So in brief, Whenever you have labels about affect or anything that is you know, emotion or anything that is subjectively defined, the better way of treating those labels is to just look at the relationship between values instead of actually looking at the value. Um, and we have applied ordinal labeling and ordinal treatment of, of labels and thereby you know, ordinal learning through machine learning, which is essentially what is called preference learning, in a number of domains. So let me show you one. Let me show you the first sort of example here of, of a collaboration between the Institute of Digital Games and Ubisoft, in which we got access to an, a data set from Tom Class's division, um, very popular game from Ubisoft, first person shooter. And we were asked to predict particular motivational factors of players. So how would we do that? How, how could we do that? Well, Ubisoft had implemented an in-house questionnaire about motivational profiles that was based on self-determination theory. So we had all the gameplays from all these people on one end, and on the other end, we had scores about motivational scores uh, and their profiles through, uh, you know, filling in their questionnaires. So what we were asked to do was to basically learn the relationship be between gameplay features, critical gameplay features that were sort of co-designed with uh, Ubisoft massive game designers and responses to this survey, the UPEC survey of, of Ubisoft. In between, we used uh, preference learning algorithms like you know, RankNet algorithms like neural network-based algorithms or even you know, SVM-based uh, algorithms like Rank SVM to learn to predict responses about presence, competence, autonomy, relatedness, the four factors that we're considering the survey, and gameplay. So the result is quite astonishing in the sense that we can predict those four levels, those four factors with very, very high levels of accuracy like in, in some cases over 90%, just looking at particular 
high level gameplay features like you know the amount of time you spend on a level or how many people you you killed how many times you were killed and, and so on why is that important for ubisoft and any other company out there because there's a motivational profile that is sort of available and enabled anytime you play a game and and thereby a game designer, a game developer will be able to know what is your motivation profile at any time, every time you play a game, and thereby offering you better content that maximizes, let's say, your autonomy or your competence in these games. Or maybe, you know, offers you content levels or even opponents that they're right for you. You know, it's like matchmaking mechanism for, um, for gameplay. So the next step beyond gameplay features, and you know, we're excited with the results we got over there. Uh, we're able to predict motivation of players with over 90% of accuracy. So that's great. But uh, those models, those player models, more motivation models, were based on predefined expert knowledge-based features, ad hoc design features of the gameplay. So the next step, the next step for us, the next natural step was to ask the question, what if we could actually do such a thing just by observing the pixels of a screen, of the game screen, just the, the game screen, just the footage, or maybe even consider the audio of the interaction. So in this work with uh, Kostas Makadasis, Antonios Lapis, and myself, we that was published last year at the IEEE Transaction and Affected Computing, we essentially tried to predict the intensity of emotion just by looking at the pixels uh, of your screen. And the outcome is quite impressive in the sense that we can actually do that. We can actually predict the levels of arousal just by looking at the pixels of the screen. And what you see here is like four different games that we try to predict uh, the level of uh, arousal. Uh, Essentially, we tried out different CNN convolution neural network architectures and different representations between pixels, sounds, and uh, arousal, which was, which was provided as an arousal tracer as sort of a, a demonstration, an experience demonstration uh, on every video, on every gameplay video that we had in our database. So depending on the game, obviously um, the model varies with regards to accuracy, but overall it does very, very well in predicting arousal. So let's let's see at uh, this particular example up here. What you see next to the game is the activation map of, map of the neural network that uh, learns to predict arousal. And what you would be able to see is that there are higher activations indicated by red color around the player. And at the same time, there are activations around the score and around, let's say, you know, the health bar down here and so on. So that tells us that basically that finding was quite uh, revealing in the sense that the neural network needs to associate what happens in the game, on the gameplay, you know, around the player with particular user interface elements so that it learns to predict arousal, which is awesome. And this is what it was sort of like, we're expecting, but we're able to see through these activation maps. So the answer to the question, can I predict emotion through pixels and maybe sound, is yes, you can. And uh, with varying, varying degree of success, depending on the game you're dealing with. So we had seen really good results in very different games when it comes to predicting particular emotional patterns of players using in-game features all the way to pixels. Our next step was to look at the generality of these findings. So look at ways we can predict emotion across games or across players. In order to do that, we had to create a data set. So uh, currently we're collecting and we're still sort of updating what we call the gain data set, the affect game annotation data set. Currently we have over or nearly 40 hours of annotated videos, 124 participants and so on. So, and we have nine games that you see here from three different genres like racing, shooters and platformers. And each one of these videos of gameplay is annotated with regards to arousal, 
right? So we have an annotation trace, a line, a moment-to-moment -moment annotation, arousal value for each particular moment, for each particular gameplay video that we have. Uh, now with, with the game data set uh, and the generality of, of player experience, the next question was, what if I can collect all the sort of exotic sensors in my lab, in my computer lab, like I can, I can have players that play their game and then I can maybe monitor their skin conductance, their facial expressions, their blood volume pulse, their heart rate, and then I can use that information to model their emotion. Uh, well, that's great. You can actually do that in, in a computer lab and effective computing has been dedicated to that particular task for many years. Now, the main question arises when you actually wish to transfer that model of emotion that you just trained in the lab out there in the wild, in the real world. This is a fundamental question and challenge for effective computing. And our response to that sort of transfer from in vitro to in vivo is through privilege formation. What is privilege formation? Is a learning paradigm within machine learning where you can actually train a teacher model on all existing modalities that you have in the lab, train a student model only on the modalities, on the information basically that you have in the wild, and then transfer some of that knowledge from the teacher to the student. The result is quite astonishing because the student now learns how to predict emotion very well, even in the wild, when those modalities are not available, right? So these modalities are not available. And, uh, you know, we first train, as I said, a teacher on the privilege formation, a student on readily available formation. And this is a knowledge transfer of the teacher to the student through a particular loss function. So even though the student only have access to particular less modalities in the wild, it still performs very well. And we saw that through two different games. Because, hey, when you play a game in your house, you don't have access to all the sort of exotic sensors. You might only have access to the pixels of the screen or you know, limited information about the features of what you're doing. Uh, so check it out. Check this paper out if you're interested more in the application of privilege information for emotion recognition and affective computing. Because we, we think it's a very, uh, very important study uh, and step towards realizing affect models in the wild. Another final study uh, I will be showing you today on, uh, the on the use of AI for modeling player emotions in games is this one, which I'm particularly proud of, the work of Matt Bartet and other colleagues at the Institute of Digital Games, where we introduce the notion of reinforcement learning, the paradigm of reinforcement learning for modeling human emotion in games as a starting domain. So traditionally, as I said earlier, traditionally the, the task of effect modeling uh, is viewed from a supervised learning lens. But what we did here with Matt was to adopt and employ a very well um, established algorithm with quite high promise in hard exploration tasks, which is called Go Explore. The paper, the, the, the introductory paper of the algorithm was published in Nature like last year. Now, what Go Explore can do for you is it can so, solve really hard exploration tasks like uh, you know, planning based Atari games. And it did, it did a marvelous job there. So what we did is to take Go Explore and apply it for imitating human players in games and imitating both. And by imitating, I mean both their behavior and their emotion. So essentially, we end up with generative agents, generative personas, as we call them, that they both play the way you play and feel the game as you would. Now, you might ask yourself, so like, how, how, how do we know that they actually feel like I do? Well, we leave them, we leave those agents like two types of information. We leave them demonstrations in the form of play traces and also in the form of arousal traces. Then we can use those demonstrators to shape reward functions that uh, would guide Go Explore or Go Blend in this case, as we call it, to find 
strategies, policies that would play uh, in the similar way that you do and also feel the game in the similar way that you do. So let's let's look at this video from a racing game. We call it a solid rally. We had about 100 players playing this game and collecting the de demonstrations from uh, their play traces and arousal traces. And what you see right here is a generative agent, a go blend agent, go explore agent that blends behavior and experience by trying to imitate the score of the human player, as you see down here. And at the same time, trying to imitate the arousal response from gameplay, right? So as you'll see here, arousal goes high, sky rocketing because you know it's exciting sort of part of the level. And our AI agent is, is able to keep, uh, to follow that sort of trend, you know, in, in increasing arousal. Um, so yeah, that's that's all exciting because uh, at least to me, because you can use these agents. Think about it; you can actually use such agents to automatically test your games in a believable manner, in a human-like believable manner, both at the behavioral dimension, but also at the experience dimension, which is something quite revolutionary here when it comes to um, believable automatic game testing through AI, right? So let's move on. Let's, let's look at the last part of my presentation. I would like us to focus on domains beyond games where this technology of AI for playing games, for creating representation, for generating parts of games and for understanding players and their emotions can be applied to other domains. And I'll start with architecture and design. The very first thing that I want us to uh, I want us to see is this project of, of ours in collaboration with several partners that is called Prismark, in which we offer AI assistive tools for the AEC industry, architecture, engineering, construction. So what you might be able to see here, let me just uh, also just use the laser pointer. What you are able to see here is like an initial geometry on the VR setting that has been designed by an architect, let's say. And what you observe here is the creative dialogue between the architect and the AI tool that generates a number of suggestions. There are four here. Those suggestions are generated through a quality diversity algorithm that we have developed in-house. Quality diversity algorithms are evolutionary computation-based algorithms that not only maximize for certain qualities, fitnesses, let's say, of a solution, but they also uh, attempt to create several of those solutions uh, which are as diverse as possible across some sort of uh, dimensions that we specify. So what is beautiful with quality diversity is like uh, you, can, you can explore in a better fashion in highly deceptive problems like you know, design. So you see four different suggestions here that come, um, come from this um, original sort of design. And uh, now let's suppose that uh, the, uh, the architect is uh, selecting this one because that one was you know, the one that uh, she likes. Um, while the, the architect is interacting with all the system, we keep logging whatever the architect is doing and we maintain an architect model like a player model, as we, we talked about later on, right? So we actively update the, the architect model, the aesthetics of the architect, or whatever the architect's preferences are, or let's, let's call it the architect's intent or the designer's intent. All of these aspects can be modeled computationally and can be used as a driver for quality diversity, right? As some sort of fitness function for quality diversity. And what you're, you're, you're able to see here is the next step of interaction. So like the AI is generating four different suggestions and that interaction can go on forever up until the point that the, you know, the architect is happy with the final outcome. And then the architect can actually zoom in and look at the generated rooms within that, uh, that building and decide whether he or she is happy or not uh, continue the interaction with the AI or just stop it. Now, staying within architecture um, and the application of algorithms, of generative algorithms within Minecraft, 
in this in this case we applied we employed the algorithm we introduced some years ago which we call delenox that is up here in this paper if you're interested in more details uh, on minecraft so what is delenox to start with delenox is combines forms of gradient search and evolutionary search in the sense that you have divergent algorithms from evolution like novelty search basically algorithms that look for novel behaviors and generate novel Minecraft buildings in this case. So keep generating stuff, uh, which are then compressed through denoising autoencoders, which then in turn, you know, the latent vector of the autoencoder can be used as, uh, you know, the starting point as a representation for novelty search to keep exploring. And we alternate those phases of transformation and exploration in an iterative fashion, you know, step by step, every time increasing the complexity of the neural network. So eventually what we end up doing here is what is called iterative refinement, right? Which is the natural process that any designer would follow for any, any human designer will follow in any task, like from architecture to game design, right? So we imitate this, this procedure through Delanox by compressing, by transforming the search space and then exploring a new set of uh, solutions, compressing those solutions and so on. So the outcome is this. You have a neighborhood of really cool, novel, weird, weird looking buildings that you see over here. And um, that can be, you know, look like that, that, that can satisfy certain constraints like uh, you know, structural or even aesthetical constraints that we might want to decide, right? So this is a demonstration of what what can be done within within architecture and um, the ways generative AI can help inspiring designers. Let's move on to urban design. And this is work by Theodor Galanos and uh, and colleagues and Antonio Zlaps and myself uh, in the application of quality diversity algorithms like Mapalitz for urban design. What you see here is the original MIT campus or parts of MIT campus with gray. We uh, illustrate the MIT buildings with blue. You have the residential area. And our mission here, our goal here was to revamp the whole residential area so that the whole area around the MIT campus, campus feels better in the sense that the comfort levels from wind is much higher than it is nowadays. So through quality diversity, we managed to redesign the residential area. So it's actually completely destroyed the residential area and changed you know, where, where the blocks are and so on. Uh, and this version of the MIT campus gives so much higher comfort levels to its citizens, right? So. These are the things you can do with quality diversity and evolution for urban design beyond architecture. Um, so let's move to art as the second domain uh, because yeah, art is, and visual art and digital art is one of these sort of domains that can be, has been influenced drastically from generative AI systems. And I'll just show you one example on that end, which is a recent work again by Theodor Galanos, Lyapis, and myself on what we are called the effect, on what we call the effect GAN system. It's effect based generative art driven by semantics. What you see here is um, a synthesis of a clip system, like a language model, a contrastive learning language model in combination with, with a GAN generator of art. We basically retrained the GAN on, uh, on the WikiArt data set. And then we were able by using clip and by, you know, by using actual language uh, semantics to be able to generate effect-based paintings, right? From particular genres. So you see some examples here. We, we type like an angry landscape and we got that or a happy sketch and study or you know an angry portrait and so on and uh, we run a user study where we asked uh, people to, to basically give us labels uh, for for whatever was generated by effect gun 
And, uh, you know, we, we got some really high correlation values of what the system generates and what people think it generates, which is great. But it was on, not always the case. Sometimes we got some really weird paintings like this one, a happy Jenner painting with some sort of cartoonish sort of um, emoji. Uh, but still, you know, the things that you can do nowadays with uh, generative systems, GANs and language models like CLIP, and so on, it's, it's quite, uh, quite astonishing when it comes to uh, visual arts. Let's move on from art to education. And uh, here, I'd like to show you one more example of the use of AI in games for educating our children. So not only games can be used to advance the AI, but they can also be used as a medium to teach about the core principles of AI. So what we did here in the Learn to Machine Learning project was to design a game that we called Artbot, which you can find in Google Play uh, and you can download, you can actually access through artbot.net. Um, and um, the aim of the project, the aim of the, of the, of the uh, game was to, as I said before, to, to train basic principles of AI. So, we met with uh, several sort of experts, uh, pe pe pedagogues basically from primary school and secondary school education, and we co-designed this game and we developed that the uh, Institute of Digital Games. So let me play the video so we can go through through it uh, through the details of it as we go along. So Artboard has two games, two mini games. In the first game. Students are trained on the basic principles of supervised learning. And uh, in this very simple task, they pick uh, an avatar, a robot, and they try to train it to distinguish between paintings and sculptures. So they provide a data set and then they change the input, input space, like how many colors of the image um, the robot should look at or how deep the decision tree is going to be. And then they train the decision tree uh, and they can actually observe the decision tree that they trained. And then if they don't like what they see, if they don't like the accuracy of the, um, of the decision tree on their test set, they can go just back and sort images again or change the parameters. So, so thereby learning the basics of supervised learning and decision tree learning. Now in the second game, once you have trained your avatar to distinguish between paintings and sculptures, then the child is tasked to train the same avatar to uh, collect all the statues from a virtual museum and then basically find the exit. So in the first step, the child sort of identifies what is good and what is bad, like penalties and rewards in a reinforcement learning scenario, right? And then plays a bit with core parameters of reinforcement learn learning, like exploration versus exploitations and so on, and uh, observing the behavior of, of Artbot in, in this scenario. Again, learning the very basics of reinforcement learning. So the game is out there. It has, it has been tested in several countries in Europe so far. Uh, it has been played by thousands of kids uh, in primary schools. So you're very welcome to play it. This, far more than the game in artboard.net actually, there's pedagogical material that you can use in class, didactic scenarios um, and guidelines on how to actually use a game. So feel free to download and play. So let's move next, which is the last part of my presentation focusing on the game AI core evolution, which uh, already, talked about at the beginning of my presentation, but I just want to give you like two examples, two indicative examples of what exactly I mean. So I'll start with the work of Elizabeth Camilleri, a student of mine in Malta, in which we looked at level generation from, or we looked at actually agent believability from a very different perspective. So let me play the video while we're, yeah. Let's see the video while we're talking. So what you see here is like a Super Mario Bros variant here with a penguin. Uh, you, you have an AI agent that actually plays the game. And uh, the question here was, how can we possibly maximize the believability of an agent, of an AI agent, or even a human actually? Um, 
by not changing the controller itself, the AI agent controller, but instead by changing the environment that this agent lives in, all right? So, and in a sense, we, we try to reframe the problem of the task, the, the task of agent control from the environment perspective. So not only we could contribute to higher degrees of believability by changing the controller of the agent, which is what, what is done traditionally and predominantly in artificial intelligence, but we also showed by changing the environment through level generation, you can actually um, make agents to be perceived even more believable, right? So this is one of the first examples of sort of the environment adapting to particular needs of the agent and you know the other way around potentially. And I'll show you what I mean in this particular final example of mine, where what you will observe here in terms of uh, gameplay is two agents acting at the same time, one AI agent that actually plays the game and another AI agent that actually designs a game for, for the player, for the Mario player, for the Mario AI player. The AI designer now designs the level so that the fun level of the player is maximized. How do we measure fun? Well, we had to read some books about it, The Theory of Fun by Ralph Koster, and we came up with quantifications of fun, suggesting that fun essentially, according to Koster, is moderated levels of unexpectedness or moderated levels of diversity, let's say, in a, in a level. So with that in mind, we trained a reinforcement learning agent that basically sees what the player is doing sees what the level contains and on, in an online fashion, it creates the level as the, as the agent goes by. So this is how it looks and it's quite impressive because none of that that you see here has been pre-designed. It's designed on the fly as the player is playing, right? So that uh, the, the level of fun is, is increased. So we call this uh, framework the experience-driven PCG via reinforcement learning framework that combines experience-driven PCG with uh, PCG via reinforcement learning, like viewing the content creation process as a reinforcement learning process and integrating experience models like fun models here, right? So check it out if you're interested. There's more, there's upcoming studies on this with far more impressive results, uh, but you can think of, you know, the capacity of the algorithm being able to generate variant levels that they are fun for a very, very simple agent like this one, which is an A-star agent, very quite quite boring agent actually. So imagine what the algorithm can do with actual, with humans that they play in more variant ways, right? So, and that basically uh, takes us to the very last part of my presentation. Uh, just to sum it up here, what I want you to remember from this AI cafe talk today is that games have traditionally been one of the last and the final frontiers of AI, and they're still around us. They took now the, the form of metaverse as we hear it and as it's celebrated, but the metaverse actually existed way before it was invented as a, as a term in the form of games, of multiplayer online games. So games will be there as the final frontier for, for AI, uh, as, as you might want to call them, right? Simulated worlds, games, uh, and so on, metaverse. And AI will and is the actual final frontier for games in the sense that it can help us improve games, their design, their development. It can also help us create entirely new games that we haven't seen before. It can help us test games and make them better. And um, that basically sums up my presentation for today. But before uh, I'll say goodbye, I just have two quick announcements to make that if you're interested in the intersection of AI and games, you are very welcome to visit gameaibook.org and read this book by myself and, and Julian Dogelius which is an introductory book on, uh, on the principles of AI and games. And if that is not enough, you're welcome to join the AI and Games Summer School that happens this summer in Crete, in the beautiful town of Hanya, in partnership 
with Google, Meta AI, Electronic Arts, Microsoft, and more uh, companies with amazing talks from uh, from these people uh, in the ways that the, the various ways they have been using AI in their sort of game production and uh, game development projects. So check it out. Uh, when it comes to the AI and, and game summer school, the website is school.gameaibook.org. And final slide, I promise, is this one. If you work with games, if you do research with games and uh, you have cool things to publish or to report to the community, then pick the best of your work and submit it to the IEEE Transactions on Games. The website is very easy to remember, transactions.games. The journal is basically, IEEE Transactions on Games is the premier journal that hosts technical, scientific, and engineering research around games, right? So check it out and uh, we'll be very happy to receive your submission. So with that, I would like to thank you once more. Thank, the, thank Carmen and uh, the AI Cafe for hosting me. It has been um, a great pleasure.